Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to NREC Tech Talk, Construction Activities with the NRC. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. For the best experience, please turn off any VPN or Citrus connections. Please submit any questions by typing your question into the question section of our control panel. You may send questions at any time during the presentation, and we will address them during the Q&A session. For any technical issues, please, please email Cheyenne Odenthal. Her email address is in the chat section of the control panel. For any programmatic questions, please send an email to enric at inl.org. This event will be recorded and provided on the Enric website. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our speakers are Greg Oberson and Mike, Mike, well, excuse me, Michael Spencer. Michael Spencer is a senior attorney with 16 years of experience, primarily focused on new reactor licensing issues. Mr. Spencer has served as a lead attorney for applications for combined licenses, an early site permit, a designated certification amendment, and a design certification renewal. He also led the effort to develop procedures for hearings on inspections, tests, analyses, and acceptance criteria, ITAC, in combined licenses. Mr. Spencer won the Meritorious Service Award in 2020. Greg Oberson is a project manager for the Advanced Reactor Licensing Branch in the NRC's Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. Greg joined the NRC in 2007 as an engineering technical reviewer for the Yucca Mountain High Level Waste Repository. Subsequently, he spent about 10 years in the Division of Engineering in NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, managing research programs on corrosion of nuclear power plants and spent, uh, spent fuel dry storage systems. Greg recently completed a two-year special assignment working in the Office of the Executive Director for Operations on Agency Transformation-Related Activities. The bachelor's in Hello, I'm Michael Spencer. Greg and I will be presenting information on the NRC's definition of construction for licensing purposes and on the process for obtaining a limited work authorization, or LWA. Consistent with Atomic Energy Act requirements, the NRC has defined construction to distinguish between those activities that require prior NRC approval versus those activities that may be performed without prior NRC approval. The purpose of the LWA is to allow certain licensed activities to be performed before a construction permit or combined license is issued. Next slide. This presentation will explain how NRC approval is necessary to construct a reactor, describe the definition of construction in 10 CFR 50.10, and discuss the LWA process and NRC inspection of LWA activities. Next slide. NRC regulations prohibit construction of a production or utilization facility without NRC approval. This includes power reactors and research and test reactors. Please note that construction is on the site where the facility is to be operated, consistent with the concept that construction is limited to certain on-site activities, as we will explain later. Also, 10 CFR 50.10C describes the types of NRC approvals that authorize construction. These are listed on the slide. For the ESP, an accompanying LWA is necessary to conduct construction activities because an ESP by itself does not authorize construction. Next slide. 10 CFR 50.10a defines what construction is and what construction is not. This definition is replicated in our environmental regulations at 10 CFR 51.4 because this definition also has importance for our environmental review. For reference, Regulatory Guide 1.206, Revision 1, provides guidance both on the definition of construction and the LWA process. We will provide additional detail on all of these topics in this presentation. I will now turn the presentation over to Greg. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I would like to uh, reference what is meant by the term construction in accordance with the language in 10 CR FAR Part 50. That is to say, as Michael mentioned, these are the activities that could not be performed without an CP, COL, ESP with LWA or LWA. 
Uh, that does not mean that the activities referenced in this slide or that all of the activities uh, referenced in this slide could be done with an LWA. I will speak later uh, to what is within the scope uh, that can be done in an, under an LWA. Uh, per the regulation, construction includes the driving of piles, subsurface preparation, placement of backfill, concrete or permanent retaining walls within an excavation, installation of foundations or in-place assembly, erection, fabrication or testing, which are for various structures and systems or components uh, or SSCs, which are listed in 10 CFR 50.10. Uh, the general idea that you would want to um, uh, have on your mind is that construction includes on-site in-place activities with a reasonable nexus to NRC regulated safety and security issues. Uh, with respect to the safety and security nexus, I mean those structure systems and components which for instance uh, would mitigate the consequence of an accident or prevent an accident or which may concern for instance physical security or fire protection. And I'll, uh, in this slide I'll mention what is not construction again with reference to the regulation. Uh, examples of what is not construction include excavation and site preparation or exploration. Uh, regulatory, regulatory Guide 1.206 gives a uh, uh, further uh, definition of what is meant by the term excavation. Um, in this case, excavation refers to the removal of any soil, rock, gravel, or other material below the final ground elevation of the final parent material. Uh, thus, excavation activities may be included, uh, conducted without a COL, LWA, or ESP uh, authorizing LWA activities. What is not construction also includes building fences, roads, parking lots, uh, transmission line, uh, service facilities, uh, support buildings for construction. That is to say, for instance, support buildings which would be necessary to undertake construction activities but would not be necessary for the operation of the reactor. Uh, procuring of fabricated parts at other than the final installed location. Again, I'll give you reference to the uh, to the um, notion that we refer to the final installed location. That is to say that um, LWA would not be required for work uh, done off-site or even on-site um, in a warehouse, test facility, or laydown area that is not the final uh, location. And also manufacturing a reactor is not itself a construction activity. Again, um, if other than uh, that is to say, it is not a construction activity if it is other than the final installed location. Uh, what is also not construction, uh, I'll reference again 10 CFR 50.10, uh, the erection of buildings which were used for activities other than the operation of, of a facility and which may also be used to house a facility, such as the construction of a college lab building with space for the installation of a training reactor. Uh, but only if the facility is not a power reactor or a testing facility and the facility must be licensed under Atomic Energy Act uh, 104A or 104C. Uh, nevertheless, the building uh, in which that facility uh, would be uh, operated should be appropriate uh, for the purpose um, that it is being, uh, in, in which it is intended to be used. And on this slide, I'll uh, make reference to some um, implications for uh, what I've just discussed on the uh, scope of technical reviews. Um, if an applicant claims that a structure system or a component does not have a safety function, and therefore that work associated with the fabrication or building of that structure system or components would not require an LWA, uh, that claim would need to be evaluated by NRC. Uh, the complexity of the analysis and evaluation of that claim uh, will affect the timing of the NRC review. Uh, second, uh, the placement of structures such as retaining walls would eventually be removed before fuel load is considered to be temporary and not would not be within the scope of an LWA. If, however, an applicant decides to leave in place structures that were necessary for construction but which are not necessary for operation of the of the facility, it would be necessary for NRC to evaluate the assertion that those would not have an effect uh, on the safety of the reactor uh, by their presence. Uh, further examples uh, of these, uh, both of which were of what I just mentioned in those uh, previous bullets, are provided in Regulatory Guide 1.206. I would note that early engagement with NRC on these topics, uh, for instance, in pre-application space, would likely be beneficial for both the applicant um, and the agency. I'll turn it back now to Michael. Thank you, Greg. 
the NRC uses the term pre-construction to refer to those activities that NRC regulations define as not being construction, such as excavation and the other items that Greg described. Just because prior NRC approval is not required for an activity does not mean that it has no safety or environmental significance. You can fabricate components off-site without NRC approval, but if you want to install them in an NRC licensed facility, they must meet NRC requirements, including quality assurance. Similarly, an applicant must consider pre-construction impacts in its environmental report. Finally, pre-construction activities might require a license or permit from another federal, state, or local agency. Next slide. The definition of construction has changed over time. This is important context for understanding past NRC decisions. When construction was first defined in 1960, it had a safety focus, which is conceptually similar to the current definition. In 1972, the NRC revised its rules to require NRC approval prior to conducting certain activities with environmental, as opposed to safety, significance. But in 2007, the NRC revised the definition of construction to return to its original safety focus. The NRC did this because it concluded, based on federal court case law, that NEPA does not expand the NRC's jurisdiction. While NEPA does not require the NRC to license those activities with only environmental significance, pre-construction activities must be considered in the applicant's environmental report, as discussed previously. With that, we've completed our discussion of the definition of construction and I will now turn to the LWA process. Next slide. The NRC created the LWA process in 1974. This was at a time when the NRC required prior approval for certain activities with only environmental significance. Therefore, there were originally two types of LWAs, an LWA-1 for the activities of environmental significance and an LWA-2 for those activities with a safety nexus. Given the 2007 revision to the definition of construction, there is now only one type of LWA, which is roughly equivalent to the former LWA-2, and that it is for activities with a safety nexus. Since the 2007 rule, the NRC has issued two LWAs, one for the Vogel ESP and one for the Vogel Combined License. The Vogel ESP LWA was used and even amended several times. For the Vogel Combined License, the LWA was issued concurrently with the combined license. This LWA had no real independent significance because the COL also authorizes construction. I will now turn the presentation back to Greg. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so previously, uh, I had mentioned to you what is construction per the regulations in 10 CFR Part 50, which again is those activities which cannot be undertaken without a CP, COL, ESP, or uh, with LWA or an LWA. Uh, now I will let you know the subset of those activities that could be done under an LWA per 10 CFR uh, 50. Uh, so those include uh, the driving up piles, subsurface preparation, placement of backfill, concrete, or permanent retaining walls within an excavation, installation of the foundation, including placement of concrete, any of which are for a structure system or component of the facility for which a COL or CP is otherwise required. And on this slide, I, will, uh, I am showing examples of the sort of activities that have in the past uh, in the case of Vogel and others, uh, been considered by applicants for LWAs. Uh, this does not mean that the, that the LWAs were actually um, authorized, but, the, but rather that, that this, uh, the activities referenced on this slide represent the experience base for NRC staff as it concerns engagement with applicants, and the act activities beyond this sort of which are listed on this slide would be figuratively covering new ground for NRC. Uh, so some of the activities for which uh, NRC has prior experience in considering in the context of LWA include a reactor building foundation, uh, which would involve the placement of rebar, pouring of concrete, and placement of sumps and drain lines, uh, crown foundation, crane foundation retaining walls uh, that were abandoned in place, auxiliary building foundations, uh, water intake structures that have a nexus to safety, 
And I would note that the review timeline for activities uh, potentially within the scope of an LWA would be dependent upon the um, scope of activities, which is to say how expansive would be the set of activities that the applicant proposes, as well as the degree of pre-applicant engagement with uh, pre-application -applica engagement with NRC. Um, and as mentioned, pre-application engagement is uh, likely to be uh, a prudent uh, course of action. And now I'll turn it back to Michael. Thanks, Greg. In this slide, I will cover who may apply for an LWA and how. First, the who. I've quoted the regulations on the slide, but it boils down to those applying for a license to construct a commercial facility or a testing facility. Note, testing facility is a term of art that is defined in 10 CFR 50.2. A testing reactor and a research reactor are two different things. Now, I will cover the how. An LWA application may be submitted as part of a complete combined license or construction permit application. However, the regulations also allow, in certain situations, for the LWA application to be submitted as a partial application for a combined license or construction permit. This partial application may be submitted up to 18 months earlier than the rest of the application, which allows a combined license or construction permit applicant to jumpstart the LWA process, as discussed in a later slide. Finally, an LWA may be requested with an ESP application or by the holder of an ESP. Next slide. The LWA application must include a safety analysis report, an environmental report, and a redress plan. I will not speak to these items in detail except to say that these documents must focus on those activities that are within the scope of the LWA. For example, per 10 CFR 51.49, the environmental report must describe the LWA activities, the need for the LWA, the environmental impacts of the LWA activities, and the mitigation measures that are being used or were considered. I note that depending on whether the LWA request is being submitted with an application for another license or permit, there may be variations in the information to be addressed as discussed in 10 CFR 51.49. Next slide. To issue an LWA, the NRC must issue a final EIS and make positive safety findings on the LWA activities. Also, the presiding officer of the proceeding must make certain safety and environmental findings. Per NRC regulations, there is a contested hearing opportunity on an LWA application. In addition, a mandatory hearing, also called an uncontested hearing, is required. Next slide. From a schedule perspective, mandatory hearings are backloaded in the sense that they occur after the staff has completed its safety and environmental review and determined that the applicant meets NRC requirements for issuing the LWA or license. The parties are the applicant and the staff, and the procedures are informal. The presiding officer must make certain independent findings described on the previous slide, but the purpose is not for the presiding officer to re-perform the staff's review. Rather, the presiding officer determines whether the staff's review has been adequate to support the necessary findings. The contested hearing process, on the other hand, is, from a schedule perspective, somewhat front-loaded. The notice providing an opportunity to request a hearing is issued shortly after the application is docketed. The purpose of this type of hearing is to allow members of the public to challenge the application. To have the hearing request granted, the hearing request must show standing and provide an admissible contention. Standing is a legal term of art referring to the petitioner's legal interest in the proceeding. Standing usually involves a claim that the facility would have some safety or environmental harm that would affect the petitioner. Contentions are claims that the application does not meet NRC requirements. Contentions must be specific, well-supported, and material to the NRC's findings for issuing the license or approval. Contention requirements are strict by design. If the hearing request is granted, an evidentiary hearing will be held unless the admitted contentions are dismissed beforehand. For example, if the admitted contention claims that the application does not address a topic that it must address, 
that a revision to the application that discusses the topic could lead to the contention being dismissed because the contention is based on an omission that no longer exists. However, there, however the petitioner would have an opportunity to file a, con a contention on the new information. Any evidentiary hearing would be held after the staff completes its review of the portions of the application dealing with a contested issue. For environmental contentions, this would occur after the final EIS is published. For safety contentions, this could occur when the staff issues a portion of the safety evaluation report on that topic. Evidentiary hearings typically involve a detailed testimony and position statements on focused issues, followed by an oral hearing in which the presiding officer questions the party's witnesses. Finally, the procedures for a contested hearing are more formal than for a mandatory hearing, which properly reflects the contested nature of the proceeding. I will now turn it back to Greg. Thanks, Michael. Uh, now I'm going to talk about site redress. Um, in general, the site redress, which is part of an LWA, LWA application, as Michael mentioned, I should describe the scope of actions that will be taken following the suspension of construction. The primary purpose of the redress plan is to address activities that were authorized under the LWA, such as placement of piles and, and insulation at foundations, should the LWA activities be discontinued. Uh, the redress plan must be implemented upon the following triggering events. The LWA holder terminates construction. The NRC revokes the LWA. The underlying COL or CP application is withdrawn or denied. Implementation must begin in a reasonable time frame after the triggering event and must be completed by no later than 18 months after the triggering event. And I'll turn it back now to Michael. Previously, I mentioned the phased LWA application process provided by 10 CFR 2.101 A9. I deferred discussion of this process until now because I wanted you to better understand its advantages. The main advantage is that it allows the LWA portion of the application to be submitted up to 18 months before the rest of the application, thereby allowing the LWA review and hearing process to be completed earlier. The phased application process is somewhat limited in scope. It does not apply to ESPs or to testing facilities. It does apply to combined license or construction permit applications for commercial facilities for which 10 CFR 51.20b requires an EIS. The first phase must address the LWA application content requirements in 10 CFR 50.10d and certain information in 10 CFR 50.33. The second phase must address the rest of the application. Also, the phased application process is subject to certain additional procedural requirements in 10 CFR 2.641 to 2.649, dealing with matters such as docketing, noticing, and the hearing. And now Greg will present the last slide. Thanks, Michael. I'm briefly going to end by mentioning construction activities, uh, but note that this full scope uh, of a dialogue on this topic uh, would require a separate presentation. I will let you know that NRC does initiate construction activities at the time when construction authorized by a CP, COL, uh, or LWA commences. On this slide, I referenced inspection manual chapters here indicated by the acronym IMC. They concern ITAC-related inspections, uh, as referenced to IMC 2503. And uh, other than ITAC-related inspections, here references IMC 2504. Uh, so the, the inspections related to uh, ITACs uh, may begin when a licensee is issued a COL or an LWA that contains ITAC. Uh, the inspection procedures here indicated by the acronym IP, uh, there are existing um, inspection procedures that concern various uh, dimensions of construction activities, such as work on foundation, piping, valves, and et cetera, um, indicated as inspection procedure 65001.xx, where um, the XX would uh, indicate the number associated with each of those um, examples. 
I'm in inspections for um, construction programs not directly related to ITAC that support construction of a plant license in accordance uh, with 10 CFR Part 52. I could become effective upon the issuance of a COL or LWA, and these could concern, among others, uh, quality insurance, uh, reporting uh, protocols for reporting of defects and noncompliance, uh, fitness for duty uh, for construction activities, and others. Uh, so that concludes the uh, presentation that uh, Michael and I have prepared for you today, and now we'll uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we have one from uh, Gustavo Reyes at INL. Um, with the advent, <laughs> excuse me, with the advent of microreactors and their uniquely deployably, deployability characteristics, such as transportable, autonomous, versatile. Uh, will the NRC's construction requirements be revisited to allow for such ra rapid deployments, especially during natural disaster emergency relief operations? Can you hear me all right? I can yes. hear you. Sorry, uh, I, I had a request. Uh, uh, so this is the question about mobile reactors. Yeah, it was just that the uh, NRC's construction requirements are going to be revisited um, due to microreactors' unique deployability characteristics. So I, I will say uh, I'm, I'm not a mobile reactors expert. Uh, what I do know is that there was in uh, 2020, there was a SECI paper to the commission on mobile reactors. That SECI paper stated that, uh, well, addressed well, not, not mobile reactors, it was on micro reactors. Uh, it addressed micro reactors at a fixed location and it said that um, mobile reactors, uh, consider, reactors involved uh, additional legal and policy and technical considerations. So the, the NRC still needs to work through those issues. Greg, I don't know if you have anything you can add on that. Uh, no, I don't believe that we are in a position to make a, any assertion as to whether there may be any changes in the construction uh, regulations as it pertains to micro reactors. That may be something that evolves in the course of uh, rulemaking associated with 10 CFR Part 53. Thank you both. Um, is, while we are talking about um, readdressing different regulatory guidance, is there any plans for the NRC to uh, look at and update uh, 1.206? Yeah, as was mentioned, sorry, as was mentioned, uh, regulatory, regulatory one guide, uh, regulatory guide 1.206 concerns, um, among others, um, matters related to the content of applications or uh, for licenses under 10 CFR Part 52. Uh, it would be likely be the case that our focus for NRC staff at this point is on 10 CFR Part 53 rulemaking and other matters such as the uh, content of application um, interfaces that are ongoing with uh, industry and therefore uh, rulemaking, uh, I'm sorry, updating a regulatory guide 1.206 is likely to be downstream of that uh, work. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I have a question from uh, Marcus. How long does it take to review uh, an approval in an, in an LWA? If a combined license or COL takes uh, about three to four years to review and approve, then how much sooner can an applicant start activities utilizing an LWA? Uh, I would say that I'll uh, provide a response and then Michael can as well. Um, uh, as far as a technical review uh, part of that goes, the, the review timeline for the technical uh, portion of the application would in some respect be uh, defined by the scope of activities that an applicant is um, intending to um, perform under the LWA. That is to say, if it is a limited, uh, a very limited or, or narrow scope of activities, a, a, a review time frame may be uh, significantly shorter than three to four years, um, and the broader that the scope of activities go, it would uh, expand from there. Um, I would state that the, uh, it should be clear that the uh, that the scrutiny or the the extent to which NRC uh, the scrutiny that NRC applies to a review is no less um, 
in an LWA than it would be for a COL. That is to say, if uh, work on a foundation would be a uh, foundation of a, uh, the reactor would be done under an LWA, the, the um, scrutiny applied to the safety evaluation would be the same as if it were under a COL. Uh, the only difference is that the full scope of activities under the COL it would be uh, much less uh, under um, an LWA. Um, and as Michael mentioned, there is a hearing process uh, associated with an LWA that would uh, implicate the timeline for uh, conducting LWA activities. Um, and Michael, anything you want to say about that? Um, we haven't had a process that was an LWA hearing, mandatory hearing process that was just for an LWA in a very, in a very long time. So, um, I, I, Usually, a mandatory hearing process takes several months. That for for a combined license, uh, like four months, is is pretty typical. Um, the the LWA activities would be narrower in scope. There would be fewer issues to address. Um, it uh, so you would think it could be shorter, but I don't think there's a set time time frame for those. Thank you both. I have a question from Christy. The Advanced Construction Technologies Initiative through NRIC will be testing existing technologies to cover uh, the nuclear environment. What is the best way to get the NRC involved as the technologies are demonstrated? Uh, as a technology, well, I, I believe that there are a number of, of opportunities uh, to involve NRC uh, across, generally speaking. So there are opportunities uh, that would fall, would fall within the, the scope of the um, memorandum of understanding the NRC and DOE have uh, with respect to advanced um, reactor um, technologies. It is the case that the NRC has an office of research which engages regularly with the um, industry, even DOE counterparts on uh, all matter of, of technical um, related activities. Uh, so there are opportunities to leverage and cooperate uh, that are, again, allowable pursu uh, pursuant to the memorandum of understanding that NRC and DOE have in this space. And as it so happens that uh, NRC, uh, many of these activities may be uh, fall within the scope of um, code um, like ASME code or, or other uh, consensus code and standards activities and again NRC has regular engagement uh, with uh, standards development organizations uh, so and uh, and that is to say all of these apart from the regular um, periodic um, stakeholder and other sort of meetings NRC has um, that are open to uh, outside stakeholders so many means uh, that the, the agency currently has to engage with uh, the community on um, advanced manufacturing technologies or, or any other advanced technologies, generally speaking. Thank you, Greg. Uh, concerning regulatory requirements, part 50 or 52, is the NRC open to exemptions to some activities that can be performed prior to the license? Yes, in, in limited circumstances, the NRC is granted exemptions to allow construction activities before license issuance. These exemptions would be governed by 10 CFR 50.12a and b. 50.12a has the general NRC requirements for an exemption, which are that the exemption uh, be not contrary to law, that there is no undue risk to the public health and safety, that the exemption is consistent with the common defense of security, and that special circumstances are present. And the regulation identifies what the special what special circumstances might exist that would justify an exemption. In addition, uh, 10 CFR 50.12b has special criteria for exemptions to allow construction activities before the license is issued. These are, one, whether the activities will have a significant environmental impact, two, whether adverse environmental impacts would be effectively addressed, uh, three, uh, whether the activities would foreclose, uh, would be effectively redressed, not, not addressed, the redressed. Uh, three, whether the activities would foreclose the adoption of alternatives, and four, the effective delay in conducting uh, the activities on the public interest. In 2010, the NRC issued a limited exemption to the applicant for the South Texas Project Combined License application. This exemption pertained to crane foundation retaining walls that the applicant proposed to abandon in place. This exemption is discussed in the corresponding Federal Register Notice. Uh, and the citation for that is 75 
Federal Register 69711, page 69711. Uh, the NRC uh, granted uh, other exemptions uh, in the past, but these, uh, the ones I'm aware of, uh, were issued around 40 or 50 years ago. And uh, I've, I've not had a uh, conducted a detailed study of those uh, of, of these examples. Thank you, Michael. Regarding uh, some of the applicants' um, different scenarios that they can approach in the licensing process, can you talk through how they could potentially combine an LWA in another review, like an ESP application? And how would the LWA affect the ESP? Um, and what are some uh, of the different options that the applicant has regarding uh, combining those approaches? I can take that. So I discovered, uh, well, we, Greg and I both covered some of these options uh, during the presentation, uh, but we didn't address specifically the ESP combinations. So the, the NRC regulations allow an ESP applicant, an applicant, for an ESP to apply for an LWA to be issued in conjunction with the ESP. That's, that's the language of the regulation, to be issued in conjunction with the ESP. So our, our regulations do not provide an option for issuance of an LWA prior to issuance of an ESP. Uh, separately, NRC regulations allow the holder of an ESP to apply for an LWA, and that would uh, they would have to provide the information required by the regulations for an LWA. So those are the two options that are allowed for issuance of an LWA, either in conjunction with an ESP or after the ESP is issued. Wonderful. Well, we are uh, then out of questions. So uh, I think I'm gonna conclude the, today's uh, tech talk. First off, I would like to thank uh, Michael and Greg for their very detailed presentation on the construction activities. Uh, I'd like to thank all the audience members for their attendance and participation. We will be sending out an email with a link to the presentation and the recording uh, for future reference. Uh, thank everyone for attending once again, and I hope you have a wonderful day.